Okay. So I was 25 years old in New York City. I had just moved to New York from London to top in investment banking. And I thought, I want a new watch that's going to fit my new job. Today, it's all about an Apple watch, right? But then, it was about big brands. Brands like Cartier and Rolex were all over Wall Street. But I wanted something different. I wanted something that really fit my personality, that was bold. And I decided to buy a Bulgari watch. So, I went to the bank and I withdrew some money. Because in those days, you actually did that, withdrew money. And I put that cash in my pocket. And I went to the store on Madison Avenue. And then a very funny thing happened. There I was, standing there in the store, already knowing exactly what I wanted to buy, with the money to buy it. And no one came up to me. No one waited on me. No one even made eye contact with me. So, you know, I thought for a moment, what's going on here? And it struck me that this young woman, dressed very casually for the weekend in a slouchy t-shirt and jeans and white Converse chucks, might not be their typical customer. And they thought, I couldn't possibly afford one of their products. So they were ignoring me. I gave it a few more minutes. And then I said, OK, this is ridiculous. I'm leaving. But before I left, I turned to the salespeople and I said, you know, I was here to buy one of your watches. And I'm still going to buy one of your watches. But I'm definitely not going to buy it from any one of you. And that's really too bad, because the commission, it's not going to be yours. What I had just experienced was something that pointed to a problem with companies, which is that they really don't see women as a market. They don't see the power of women as a market. Here's what happens if you Google images associated with women shopping. Take a minute and look at that screen. And you'll notice one thing that every one of those images has in common. Apparently, Google and the internet think that the only thing that women shop for is clothing. Well, not only Google, but Hollywood reinforces that myth. And Google, Hollywood, the media as a whole are dead wrong. Because women account for 85% of all purchases in the United States. All purchases, not just small purchases. Houses, cars, electronics. And this is not just a US phenomenon. It's a worldwide phenomenon because women account for 65% of all purchases worldwide. How many of you have heard of the show The Walking Dead? Probably a lot of you, because it's one of the top ranked shows on cable. In fact, it's been the top ranked show on cable for five years. And it's about the zombie apocalypse. Images like this and this are on your screen for 60 minutes. So it, let me ask you a question. How many of you think that the primary audience for that show is men and boys? Come on, show of hands. Don't be afraid to guess. How many think it's women? OK. Well, you're all right. And that's what's so interesting about this story. In 2010, when this show premiered, its primary audience was men and boys under the age of 30. And it therefore made a lot of sense that its primary sponsor was Axe, a maker of boys' and men's personal care products. Now, roll forward to 2013 and enter a bunch of entrepreneurial, young Argentine folks with a new social media strategy company. And they decided to do an analysis of what was happening on social media each day after a new episode appeared. And they found something very interesting. The single most used word in those social media conversations was spooning. You know, when two people lie together 
back to front. O en español, cuando dos personas hacen la cucharita. <laughs> so what had happened? Well, without the producers realizing it at all, the primary audience for this TV show had shifted. It was no longer men and boys under the age of 30. It was women. But not just any women. It was women over the age of 30. And not just any women over the age of 30, it was married women over the age of 30. And they no longer saw this as a horror show, they saw it as a romance. Why? Because for them, it was an opportunity to hug, cuddle, and spoon with their partners because they were afraid, or at least because they said they were afraid. So, from one day to the next, the key sponsor of this show went from this to this. And the price that the producers could, could charge for a 30-second commercial went from just under $300,000 per 30 seconds to over $400,000 per 30 seconds. And that change in their own finances, that ability to connect their product more with its actual audience was being lost because they, like so many companies, did not understand the relationship of their product with women. And this is a mistake that companies make over and over pretty much every day. But in fact, those companies that get that that have the strongest emotional bonds with women are the most valuable brands and companies that exist. They're companies that outperform the Fortune 500 and the S&P 500 in terms of both revenue and profits for the last 10 years. When you get this right, it may not be easy, but you become a much better and stronger company. In, late 19, in the late 1980s, the Ford Motor Company promoted a woman by the name of Mimi van der Molen to be the head of design for all North, North American cars, exteriors and interiors, and to develop new design concepts. Mimi was a pioneer. She was one of the very first female car engineers in the world. And now, she was the first woman to head car design at any automobile company. So one of the first things that Mimi did was she had all of her engineers come into work one day wearing long, fake fingernails. Now you can imagine that most of those engineers were men. And we learned two things that day. First, that a bunch of geeky engineers who typically had pocket protectors in their shirts but were also wearing fingernails, looked pretty funny. And the second was that they needed to make changes to their cars if they were going to be more appealing to women and safer for women. So how did that translate? Well, it meant thinner door handles, easier on the fingernails. It meant lighter trunk hoods, easier to lift, and much easier to maneuver when you had packages or children in and around your hands and arms. And lower front ends to improve the sight lines of cars and make them much safer. Well, what did all of this mean? Well, first, it was called the rounded edge revolution. And when you look at those cars, you can see how different they are and how much more contemporary they are than the ones that were there when Mimi started. These cars, became the number one selling car in North America. They represented 25% of Ford's sales. And she led Ford out of an extended sales decrease by designing this car. And we're all very lucky because her engineers did catch on after the fingernails, because if not, she was planning on having them wear skirts next time. Mimi was a pioneer. And being a pioneer is never easy. In fact, Mimi's life stories tell you all about some of those difficulties. 
And we heard today, earlier, from other pioneers and saw the same thing. For most of my career, I was an investment banker. Suffice it to say, a pretty male-dominated industry. And in fact, even to this day, the area that I worked in has very few women, private equity. I was a pioneer of sorts. I don't think I had any firsts, but I was often the only. I was the only woman at a table of men filled with rooms full of men. One day in particular sticks out in my mind. We were going to be going over to JP Morgan to pitch a new deal to a consortium of banks. I was a very good financial modeler, and I had a knack for describing financial concepts in very simple terms that everybody could catch on to. So while we were walking over there, the guy who ran the private equity group said to me, hey, you make the presentation and handle this today. OK. Well, when we walked into the room, there were somewhere between 80 and 90 bankers there. All men. And I'm told that the expressions on their faces were priceless when the only woman in the room, one of the youngest people in the room, got up to run this meeting, to make the presentation, answer their questions, and make the pitch for them to lend billions of dollars to our new deal. You can probably imagine that it takes a pretty particular skill set to do well in that kind of environment. The first skill that I found to be very useful was what I call selective hearing. You know, when you're walking down the street and you hear somebody wolf whistle, I can't do it, sadly. You don't turn around and make eye contact with the person whistling at you. Well, it was sort of like that. I spent every morning on a bond trading floor with traders who kind of epitomized the stereotypical locker room culture that everybody thinks of when they think of Wall Street. Their idea of a funny joke and my idea of a funny joke didn't usually align. But that's where the selective hearing came in. I had to decide each day what I was going to hear and what I was not going to hear. And it was that skill that not only let me thrive in that environment, rather, survive in that environment, but allowed me to thrive in that environment. The second skill is what I call the power of the sisterhood. You can't overestimate the value of networks to developing your career. And that's true for everyone. Networks allow us to grasp successes more frequently, and they also help us cushion the disappointment of failure. They make us stronger. But I would tell you that the power of women supporting women is an amazing thing. Today, women are each other's power, much more so than competition. Whether it's for new jobs or promotions, mentoring, or telling each other the truth about skills or weaknesses in our professional lives, about a bad hair day, or even a fashion faux pas. I can tell you that I wouldn't be where I am without the support of many in my sisterhood, back at Lehman Brothers and today at the IDB. The third skill is what I'll call finding and using your female superpowers. So when I left Lehman Brothers, I joined with three other people to form a new strategic advisory firm focused on Latin America. We were three women and one man. It made us one of the very few firms in this business run primarily by women. And we quickly became one of the leading merger and acquisition firms in Latin America, going immediately to the top of the rankings of the industry. There were a lot of reasons for our success. But one of them was that we had a very unique way of relating to our clients. Our clients were generally male CEOs of some of the largest companies in Latin America and the Caribbean. And many of those businesses were still controlled by family members. Now, we did great analytical work, 
And we were known for really creative designs for our deals and getting people very high prices when they sold their businesses. But I think more important than that was that we brought intuition, maybe you could call it women's intuition, to what were often very complicated family problems that were hiding under the surface of the shareholding. The kinds of problems that could destroy hundreds of millions of dollars of value very easily or get in the way of an important transaction that would let the company grow. We were also able to talk to these CEOs about very complicated and sensitive issues without them getting defensive. That was our superpower, and we were not afraid to use it. A lot has changed since then, but unfortunately, a lot hasn't. There are still way too few firms that have women in the majority or even in large numbers at the senior levels in financial firms, and in fact, in firms across the board. And that's a mistake because that's one of the reasons that firms continue to miss the value and opportunity associated with women. Women represent today income of $18 trillion. And that $18 trillion is expected to grow to $28 trillion in five years. And women control wealth of $40 trillion expected to be over $70 trillion in less than five years. These numbers make that economy bigger than that of China and the United States combined. That's what you call a market opportunity. You have a huge market growing fast and underserved. The companies who do think about serving it tend to think about serving it with their old business models. Or, when they do think about it, they think of it as an interesting little niche market. The last time I looked in a dictionary, 51% of the population of the planet is not how anyone defines a niche. And that's where the opportunity and the challenge both come from. There are many of you here today who will soon be thinking about what job, what career path should I go after next? And it's an amazing moment in this world of ours. Whether it's artificial intelligence or robotics, the Internet of Things, biotechnology, these are all things that are going to change the face of the planet for years, decades, generations to come. And that's why right now is when we need pioneers and we need female pioneers because we need to make sure that when we change the face of the planet using those new technologies we change it for a hundred percent of the population not half in 2017 an artificial intelligence trained on google news filled in this sentence Man is to computer programmer as woman is to X with the following word, homemaker. Imagine, man is to computer programmer as woman is to homemaker in 2017. You don't need to look much further than that to understand why we definitely need more women pioneers in these new areas. And it won't be easy. For sure, I'm sure the skills that some of us have developed and talked about today will be needed skill sets, and you'll develop new skills of your own. But the time is now for all of us. It's the time to take our skills and our superpowers to break down barriers and change behaviors and make sure that time really is up because it's no longer about pretty women. It's about powerful women. And it's about powerful women with the power of the purse. Thank you.